anxious when I am afraid I take it to God I call on His name if the mover of mountains is listening to me why should I worry should I fear anything? For I know the plans He has for me. Yes, I know the plans He has for me, for my good, to give me a hope and a future. Pastor John, and we're so thankful you could join us for worship. Uh, we are going to be doing things a little bit differently today. Um, so we're actually going to be, we're not going to have a, a fellowship time today. Um, just for this one Sunday, we're going to actually be doing the sermon uh, towards the beginning of the service, and then we are going to apply that service, uh, apply that sermon to our lives by worshiping uh, for the rest of the service today. We are going to have some announcements. We have some awesome ministry updates for you guys. But this morning, I do want to welcome any of our guests, uh, newcomers, new uh, new believers. We want to welcome you here. Um, if you want to fill out a Connect card, it's in the seat back in front of you, and we would love to follow up with you. If you've never been here and you want to know more about the church, um, you can drop that in the bowl, in the boxes, or give it to one of our greeters. And we have a few announcements for you now. Good morning. How are y'all? Um, okay, so we're going to go through a few of our announcements. Um, they're on the back of the bulletin, and there's also one inside of it. Um, so we're having our annual Awana Trunk or Treat, which will be Wednesday, October the 30th, during the regular Awana hour. So they'll eat at 6, then from 6.30 to 8, they will have their Trunk or Treat in the gym. Um, it will just be tables set up kind of like 
you would with a car in the um, whatever that is out there, the yard, <laughs> parking lot, there you go. Um, but we ask no scary costumes. And if you would like to donate candy, please see Donna Walls. Um, and then we have our fall festival, which is going to be Friday, November the 15th um, from 5 to 8. It's going to be for all of the community. We're going to have games, a hayride, um, food, you know, um, everything for the fall festival. Um, and then the re-entry backpack drive. Um, Emily announced this last week. Um, there is a box in the foyer. It's blue, and it's got this little flyer on the front of it. Um, if you would like to donate, um, there is a QR code on the um, sheet in your bulletin. You can just scan that, click the items you want to order, and they will be shipped to um, either here or Emily's house. I'm not quite sure, but we will get those. But if you want to bring anything in, um, that's great too. You can just drop them in the um, blue box back there in the foyer. Um, and today is Pastor Appreciation Day. So we, this is John's first Pastor Appreciation Day at Voice of Tree Church. So, John, we just want to thank you so much for um, everything you've done and you're continuing to do in this church. We love you so much, and we just thank you for you and your family and your boys. And, Emily, um, you are just a joy to have around us, and we just love you all. So we've got a little something for you. <laughs> Oops. All right. Hello. Wednesday night, we had the opportunity to go to a Fields of Faith event for the 6th through 12th graders in Milledgeville. Uh, it was Brian and my wife and myself. And then we had 14 uh, 6th through, I think, 6th through 12th graders that went. Uh, it was, a yeah, it was very exciting. Um, you know, the, the theme of the message was... Uh, through a, from a few places in scripture. The first was in Revelation chapter 3 with the church of Laodicea. I'm sure we're all very familiar with, you know, Christ would rather us be hot or cold, but if you're lukewarm, then uh, he will spit you out of his mouth. And another thing the preacher uh, preached on was that there isn't a sinner's prayer in the Bible that he has found. And so I think he grew up in a lot of the same situation that I did where we went to these tent revivals and at the end of the service you were called down to repeat a prayer after someone and then uh, a lot of my understanding of it was that, oh, now I'm, now I'm good, now I'm saved um, because I, I came down and said these words. Um, so he preached uh, a little bit uh, about that and then... Uh, he preached out of Matthew chapter 7 where, where Christ said that there will be many of you who will come to me and say, Lord, didn't we preach in your name and didn't we cast out demons and do all these miracles? And Christ will say, uh, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. So uh, it was a very powerful and straightforward message. Uh, we had two students that had a profound spiritual movement. Um, you know, I, I don't, I think that... Uh, if it wasn't salvation, then there was definitely uh, a recommitment. And uh, uh, so that was a great blessing. Um, I mean, there were tears and confession. And uh, so it was a, a great time that we had with the students. And hopefully we can do many more things like that in the future. So thank you all. Um, so we're going to take this time uh, to give of our tithes and offerings. Um, we're going to sing one more song before the sermon, and so you can take that time to drop any offering you want to give down in the bowl or at the boxes next to each of the exits, and we have offering envelopes. And you can also do that at the end of the service if you would like as well. Uh, but when you give here, this is the kind of ministry that you give to support. You give to support relief from the hurricanes, which we've been heavily involved in that, and our student ministry that's doing awesome things right now with Awana and curriculum, and they're hearing the gospel and being encouraged. So let's Let's stand and let's sing this song together as we give of our tithes and offerings. Grace that flows like a river washing over me 
Fount of heaven, love of Christ, overflow in me. Thank you, Jesus. You set me free. Christ, my Savior, you rescued me. Children can be dismissed. If you want to go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 3, that is where we will be today. The year was 2016. Emily and I lived in Oklahoma. I was in my late 20s. It's hard to believe now that I'm in my late 30s. But it was in that faithful year, my parents gifted my children a trampoline. And if any of you dads out there have ever been, uh, you know, you've put together large toys and large items for your children, you understand the frustrations of uh, pulling out something that has a thousand pieces and then you are given these instructions that are extremely frustrating. And I remember uh, when this gift turned into a curse was as I was looking at the instructions, they were so vague. The instructions did not give me much detail as to how this thing was supposed to be put together. And I blame Walmart. 
And uh, I was, as I was putting this thing together, I accidentally broke a couple of pieces on the trampoline because I was doing it incorrectly. And I remember the moment, and I want to just clarify, this is a confession. I am a, I am a man of the flesh at times where I, I succumb to my sinful nature. Hopefully I have matured uh, now uh, since my late 20s. But it was the first time I ever took a hammer and threw it into a privacy fence. Out of anger. I was very angry. I hated that trampoline. Luckily, we used it, and then I just left it. When we moved, I left that trampoline. I was like, we are done with that evil curse that came upon me. But what was so frustrating, it's like a cruel joke when you have a thousand pieces and you have an instruction booklet that is so unclear. It doesn't tell you the details of how to assemble this massive project, and that's frustrating. But here's the reality. Even though putting that thing together was very frustrating, that's not the great task that we have as a church. We have a task as a church that's been given to us, which is to dwell in unity. And so to dwell in unity is almost seems like something of a miracle, that we have to, as sinful man, dwell together as a family and love each other and care for each other. But the thing that is such good news is that Jesus did not leave us without the instruction manual. God gave us, in this, especially in the text we're going to be looking at today, he has given us the instructions in how to be a church united. And so as we all know, and we've already mentioned this, I've already mentioned this, we, have, we are living in a very tumultuous time in the history of our country. We have wars being fought overseas. We have an upcoming election that is a hotbed for anger and frustration and despair. And right now it just sometimes feels, and I know we all feel this, it seems like things are unraveling around us and there are riots and angry people and political parties gnashing their teeth at one another. And in the midst of all of that, the call for the church has not changed. The call for the church has not changed. We are called to look different than the world. We are called to look different than what Satan would want us to look like to the world. And so our main point today is we're going to get in the nitty gritty, the nuts and bolts of what it looks like as a church to be united. So the main point today, a truth speaking, and it might say this, I should have changed my main point so you can write it in if you want to, a truth speaking, truth singing, thankful community is a united community. So right now, what's really fascinating, and I love the history of the church, I love going and deep diving into the the letter of Colossians. It's so important to remember um, that this letter was written to a specific group of people. It is for the church as God's word, but it was written to a particular group of people. And so what Paul, the man who wrote this book of the Bible, he was writing to the church at Colossae. And the church at Colossae was a a church that was, Paul helped to plant this church and to create this church. And so there was a group of people, an enemy, that was facing the church. Now what we're to understand from the context is that these were people actually inside the church. This was a group of people that was teaching something that was contrary to the word of Jesus, the word of God. And so what they were teaching was most likely a group of Jewish people who were acting as though they, because they were Jewish in their heritage, they had some sort of special relationship with God that the Gentiles, all the non-Jewish people, could not enjoy. And so they were teaching this. They were saying, you have, they were teaching mystical things, like you have to worship angels. And they use this word called asceticism. Asceticism is a self flagellation to show how holy you are. Extended fasting, where you put uh, dirt on your head and you, you become emaciated and you show off to people, look how holy I am because I am fasting longer than anyone else. And what was happening is it was creating fractions in the church. So there was a group of Gentiles that did not feel like they belonged. Of course they didn't. They're like, I, I, was, once, I was once worshiping the, the god Apollos. I was engaging in worldliness six months ago until I heard of this good news of Jesus. 
I don't feel qualified to be a part of this church. And so this group inside the church is continuing to reinforce that belief among the Gentiles. And so what's happening now is that they are, there's division forming within the church. And there was arguing and fighting and frustration. And even it says that there were those seeking to disqualify the Gentiles in the church. And so last week, what we talked about at the beginning uh, in in Colossians chapter 3, we talked about the fact that Paul and, and what God was calling for the church to do is to dwell in compassionate love and forgiveness together. And so that's the call, because Christ has forgiven us of a lot, we are to forgive one another of our sins. And if one has a complaint against another, we are to go to them and bear the burden with them. And so now we get to point number one, Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. A truth-speaking community is a united community. Now let's see what the, the Word of God says to us today, verse 16. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. Now, we're going to take this a few words at a time. We're going to start with one, let. The word let means to uncover, to allow to permit something to happen in the church. And he's saying you need to allow the word of Christ to dwell in you richly. And when he says in you, this is also important. He's not talking to individuals. Now, I want to clarify, the scriptures are clear that we as individual Christians should be consuming the word of God. We should be studying it, we should know it, we should memorize it, we should make it our roadmap to life. But this in you here is important. He's saying corporate in you. So in other words, he's saying as the gathering, in you the church. You should let the word of Christ dwell among the body of Christ richly. In other words, what he's saying is, is we want the word of Christ to be readily available in this church. It needs to be spoken and read from the stage, unadulterated. There's a reason why in a few minutes, whenever we worship together, we are going to read a passage of scripture without very much explanation because we need the word of God to speak for itself at times. We need the word of God to dwell among us richly. It needs to be ever present in our conversations with each other. It needs to be read from the stage. It needs to be sung, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Now, I want to clarify this because this is a quick application for us because the church at Colossae, what was happening, which is wild to me, is there's a group in the church that has been given permission in some capacity to teach something contrary to the word of Christ. So what's happening is they're saying, hey, you have to do this. You have to worship angels. You have to have a better mystical knowledge of God and the Old Testament in order for you to be a part of our church. And this is extra biblical. This is not truth. These are false teachings that are being perpetrated by these false teachers in the church. And so this is one quick application as a church. We need to always be watching and evaluating what is being taught in the church according to the standard of the word of God. And we also need to be careful what we hold on to as truth. We need to be so careful because here's the reality. We are mankind. We are prone to wander. We are prone to wander from the truth of God's word. And this is where we need to find our foundation because here's the reality. In our world today, there are plenty of false messages coming from whatever news you consume. There's plenty of false information out there, and we have to be so careful that we don't hold on to something as being gospel truth when it's not gospel truth. At this point, you can go watch videos of UFOs and Bigfoot, and they have been doctored and manipulated by computers. Like, there is things that we often claim as being absolute truth. And wait, well, I know this for a fact. I heard. I heard this was the case. And so we have to be careful with misinformation within the church or holding on to something. Because here's what God has given us. Because we are different than the world, 
Because we are different than the world, God has given us this absolute truth. We must cling and hold to the word of God. And it was spoken from the flawless, truth-speaking mouth of God. And when all, when with God's word, there is zero false information that comes from this book. Now Paul, he quickly comes from this moment of let it dwell among you richly. And he is coming into this moment of saying, now you need to teach and admonish one another in all wisdom according to the word of God. Now why does he go from forgiveness This is how you should love each other, have compassion for each other. You should forgive each other, show grace to each other. Why does he come off of that and then come straight into, now teach and admonish each other with the word of God. This is very important because we can have pitfalls here. Both of these things need to be true. That we're forgiving and loving each other, but we're teaching and admonishing one another according to the word of God. The reason why he brings up both, and I'll give you a story There's a famous pastor, I won't name names, because he's still in ministry today, but this particular pastor has written a number of books. He is pastoring a massive church, and um, and, and he is known as the forgiveness grace pastor. He's all about grace. He's all about forgiveness. He's all about love. He's all about, we need to be a community that just loves each other. We need to forgive each other from all of our wrongdoing. This same pastor has had one affair, and he was stepped away for a short period of time and then came back to be a pastor. This same pastor then, after a few years, had another affair, a second affair. And again, he was restored to pastoral ministry. And I want to clarify, there is forgiveness for those who have affairs. I want to clarify that. We should be church a church about forgiveness. But we also have to be a church that says sin is serious. And it carries consequences. And so a church not only needs to be about forgiveness and grace and love and mercy, but we should also be teaching and admonishing according to the word of God. Because it addresses our sin. Not only does Satan want to enter the church and fracture relationships, Satan wants to enter the church with sin, habitual, unending sin in the life of Christians. He also wants to sow division through our sin. If you don't believe me, the danger of this is just read Joshua chapter 7. Achan went and stole things that he should not have stolen, and he hid them under his tent. And the next day, Israel went to war and they lost and thousands died because of his sin. So the scriptures say in Matthew 18, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Teaching and admonishing one another is something to be done among believers. We must, and admonishing, I love this word because the word admonish actually means to warn, to exhort. In other words, it's a protecting word. I'm protecting my brother or sister from himself. And so we must be about the work of seeing sin in our brothers and sisters' lives and graciously and lovingly approaching them about that sin. We are to teach and admonish one another according to the word of God that dwells among us richly. Now, I want to clarify this because it's very important, but notice the final words that he gives here. With all wisdom. With all wisdom. Now, I will I'll share this story about myself. Back when I was in college, I had a friend. He's a good, really good friend. I want to clarify this. But one day, we were just run of the mill, we're walking around college campus, we're talking, chit-chatting, all this stuff. And out of nowhere, he stops me talking. And he says, John, dude, for real. Like, all you do is talk about yourself, dude. Oh, okay, we can talk about that too. 
John, it's, it's every single time we're talking, you bring it back to yourself every single time. <sighs> okay, wow, um, all right. And then he just left me there. <laughs> now, to clarify, he was 100% right. He was 100% right. And in fact, over time, through the power of the Spirit, I would open my mouth to say something, and then all of a sudden I'd go, oh my gosh, I'm about to talk about myself. And then I'd be in the next conversation, I'd take a breath, and I'd be like, oh, I'm about to talk about myself again. What is wrong with you? And, and so all of a sudden, it was revealed to me. Now, did God use that untactful, blunt, not wise approach to grow me? Yes. So my friend did what the scriptures say, but he missed the with all wisdom part. And so the point here is, is that when you approach someone, you do so wisely. In fact, the scriptures say, let your, let your words be seasoned with salt. So with a loving posture, approach your brothers and sisters with wisdom. Not, not beating them over the head. Not attacking them. And so I want to clarify this too. We want to be careful as we do this. Because it can be one of those things where people's feelings then get hurt. Now you have to have a second conversation and it just, it becomes a thing. So I'm happy. There, there are other people in your life who are your confidant. Maybe it's a spouse. And you say, hey, I need to have this conversation with a particular person. How do I go about this? Help me. You can seek godly wisdom. Okay, I want to clarify that. Seek godly wisdom. If you're not the wisest person when it comes to conflict, seek godly wisdom. Now, I want to clarify, if you go seek godly wisdom from six people, you're gossiping. Because now you've just told six people someone else's business. And so we want to be careful not to slander, not to gossip, but with wisdom approaching our brothers and sisters with their sin, teaching and admonishing, because this is where unity comes from. It comes from putting to death together sin. We need to fight sin. It's a spiritual battle that God has called us to do. Now, the next one, notice uh, Paul, I love when he does this, but he continues his thought. Teaching and admonishing one another with all wisdom, and he doesn't put a period, he keeps going okay, in this verse. So a singing, so this is point number two, a singing community is a united community. A singing community is a united community. He says, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Now, I know these are only a few words, but there's a lot here. Now, we don't want to get hung up on the different translations of psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, but what we're supposed to glean from that is that first, the psalms are founded in the Bible. You can find those. We are supposed to read those, study those, sing those. But then there's also hymns. Hymns are written by people. Hymns and spiritual songs are written by people, but notice it's one continuous thought from the first one. This is another way that we let the word of Christ dwell among us richly, is through our songs. And we sing things that are based and founded in the scriptures. So it's very important that as we sing, that we sing songs that align with the scriptures. We need to sing songs that have good theological meat to them. We need to sing songs that make much of Jesus and his salvation alone. We must sing songs, and I want to clarify this, this is important. Someone talked to me about this one time and it kind of caught me off guard, but we want to sing songs that another religion couldn't use and it still be true of them. Because we are declaring that we are different. We're declaring something different. There are worship songs that are so vague because they don't want anyone to be offended. And so even the Mormons can sing that song. And we need to clarify that even in our singing, we are setting ourselves apart in the truth of God's word. Now, why is singing related to unity? I want to clarify this. God has made us to respond to a rally cry. God built us innate. Wow, he made us in his image. He made us to respond to a rally cry. There is a reason. God, I love, I love concerts. I, I love concerts. I love smaller venues. I got to see my favorite band in Dallas, Texas one time. And, and I will tell you that like I lost my voice. It was totally worth it. 
I couldn't hear for like two days, totally worth it. And I remember just thinking as I was standing, my, my, one of my, he's, a, he's a, a believer, they're, they're technically a secular band, but the lead singer is a, is a believer, and their songs have their foundations in his beliefs and, and in Christian beliefs. And, uh, and so, now I wasn't there to worship, I want to clarify that, but in everyone, we know that feeling when you're at a concert where you get chills, and you're, you're singing this song, and like everyone's singing together, and you're not thinking about anything else. It's the same reason we can go to a football stadium. And we're not thinking about anything else. We're just there for the team. We're there for Georgia. We're shouting for Georgia. And we're not thinking about our bank account. We're not thinking about the stress of life. We're not thinking about our, our conflict with a family member. We're not thinking about the stress of work. We're not thinking about anything else. We're just focused on the concert, on the song, the singing. We are just focused. It is built in all mankind to respond to singing. And so if it's built in all of us to enjoy that, then we as a church should redeem that. And that's why we do this on Sundays. We don't do it because it's just what the church has always done. It is a biblical mandate that the church unite around Bible-centered singing that makes much of Jesus. I remember a moment of very real clarity for me was when I was at seminary they have a massive chapel that seats like five or six hundred people and every seat was filled every single time they had chapel and I remember one time we were singing hymns like old hymns from a hymn book and I remember they were we were singing how great thou art and I remember a, a specific I remember where I was sitting and everything and I remember I don't remember the sermon that was preached I don't remember a scripture that was read I remember this moment when all of the, the music died out and we sang the chorus together and the voices were so loud and I was so enraptured in that moment with my arms raised high that I truly in that moment, all I was thinking about was how great my God is. And, and in that moment, that's, guys, that is a taste of heaven. When, when we sing, God peels back the veil of the eternity of heaven and gives us a glimpse into that because we may not truly be singing for all eternity, but we will be rejoicing in God for all eternity. And when we sing in heaven, it is going to feel, it is perfect. And so when we get to do that as a church, God is saying, I'm going to give you a little taste of heaven where you're no longer is there suffering in that moment. No longer is there, is there just junk in our lives no longer are there bank accounts. No longer are there stress in life. You are just focused on one thing. All your attention on the one who satisfies. And so God has given us singing as a gift to unify us. He's given singing as a rally cry for each one of us. Now I want to uh, rebuke a few of you in this room today. If you don't sing... You are depriving yourself and the people around you from a gift. Now, you probably will stop and you'll say, John, I am tone deaf as the day is long. And that's okay. Lean into it. Because <laughs> here's the reality. One day when you're in heaven, you're going to sound like Celine Dion or John Legend. But for now, your imperfect voice is sufficient for the body of Christ. So let us sing. Let, let's, let's shout louder the name of Jesus than the name of Georgia. Amen. Now, we'll summarize because we've talked about a lot. The community is a community that forgives one another, that loves each other. We deal with sin in a very real way with the word of God. We're a community that sings together, that sings the truth about God together, and it unifies us. And the last one is, point number three, a thankful community is a united community. Now, Paul ends here with a summary statement. He gives a summary statement of just, in general, if you, so I don't know if you ever do this with your, with your children, but you're like lecturing them about something, and, and they're, they're listening, they're nodding, you know, and I can see that vacant look on Murray's face when he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then you get to the end, you're like, stop, listen, this, I, I have one more thing I need to share with you. Listen to this. If you didn't hear anything else I said, hear this. This is what Paul's doing. 
So he's summing it all up. He's like, if, if you don't fully understand all that other stuff I said, then, then please hear this. Verse 16, with thankfulness in your hearts to God and whatever you do in word and deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Spiritual thankfulness has its roots in Jesus. There's a reason why he says, thankfulness, Jesus, give thanks. Thanks, Jesus, thanks. That's why Paul does that. He sandwiches Jesus in the middle. Jesus is at the center of our lives. He's at the center of this church. And the result of looking at Jesus, looking to Jesus, and thinking about Jesus is because our spiritual thankfulness comes from the realization that we were dead in our transgressions and sins. We weren't, we weren't just sick. We, we, weren't, we weren't just not doing well. We were, according to Ephesians chapter 2, we were dead in our transgressions and sins. You weren't just in the process of drowning, you were drowned. You were at the bottom of the ocean, underneath the, the weight of all of your sin and shame, and God in his powerful hand reached down and he rescued you from your sin. And when we think on that, when that becomes a refrain in our life, God, I didn't deserve to be here, but God, you did it anyways. You forgave me. You washed me clean. The message of the gospel leads to a grateful and thankful heart because we were rescued from hell and damnation to a new life. So thankful people are people who see the, the ugly that comes along within the church. And we go, yeah, that does, that's not good. But I'm just so thankful that Jesus saved me. And here's the thing, folks, and this is going to happen. I, I, I heard a, uh, someone say one time that Christians complain more than anybody else in the world. I don't know if that's true. But I do think it's a temptation for Christians. I mean, because Satan dangles that your life could be better, this could be better for you, that person should have never done that to you, and, and now you need to go make them pay for it by complaining about them. And, and in voice of truth, I want to clarify, we have weaknesses, every church has weaknesses. We have a hundred weaknesses in our church, but we also have a hundred things to be thankful for in this church. And, I, and I'm even going to go as far to say that one of the things that we should be grateful for, I, I, I think about this on the regular, that we actually have the freedom to worship without the threat of our lives. And many soldiers paid their lives, American soldiers paid their lives so that we could enjoy that freedom. We should be thankful for those things. And, 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 and I think about, imagine reading this passage being so excited about Jesus and you're in a basement of a house and you have to keep your voices quiet as you sing because you're afraid the authorities will hear it and you will be killed. That's how some people live right now. We should pray for those brothers and sisters in Christ, pray for their protection, but we should also have thankful hearts that we can shout as loud as we want to. We can sing to the glory of Jesus as loud as we want to. And then the last thing I will mention our thankfulness is grounded in Christ. It's grounded in Jesus. And so when we sing, when we, when we let the word of Christ dwell among us richly, the thing that is foundational to our church, the scriptures say that Jesus is the cornerstone. Jesus is the one that we make much of. He is at the center of all things. And here's the reality. These foolish Jewish people in the church at Colossae, they were saying, you have to have more knowledge, you have to have better behavior, you have to do X, Y, and Z in order for you to be accepted in this church. Well, folks, I'm here to tell you that your only item that makes you qualified to be part of the family of God is what Jesus has done for you. So we do all things in the name of Jesus. We love in the name of Jesus. We preach to ourselves the name of Jesus and our salvation that was achieved in him. And we give thanks to him in our hearts for his death, burial, and resurrection. So, so here's what we're going to do. The service obviously looks a little bit different today. So what, what we're going to do now, I'm going to invite the band to come up. And as they come up, we are going to finish 
with worship, with scripture reading, and with prayer. And so if you want, during this song, you can take a posture of prayer where you are. We're going to have a time of scripture and and a moment of silence for prayer uh, after the first song. And so we're going to practice this. Jesus is our Savior, and we have voices to shout his name out loud. So let me pray for us as we practice what we just heard preached today. Heavenly Father God, we are so, so grateful and thankful for our salvation that you've achieved for us. I pray, God, that if anyone in this room does not know you, has not experienced salvation in their heart and life, Lord, that you would open their eyes, save them today, let them place their faith and trust in you, Jesus. And I pray, God, that there would be some of us in this room, Father, convict us, Lord. Convict us where we often are are heralds of something other than truth. Convict us, God, where we've complained. Convict us for where we've dwelled in disunity or where we've held something against a brother or sister in Christ. Convict us, bring us repentance to turn, to follow you, to do what, God, what you've told us to put on. Put on compassionate hearts forgiving one another with all humility and meekness, Lord. God, I pray against the schemes of the devil. I pray against the the weapons that he comes against us with, bitterness and division, sin, shame. I pray, God, that today as we sing, we would declare our victory in you, Lord Jesus. And Lord, I pray, Father, that as we dwell in unity, that it would be fruitful, that, that people would enter our church and would just immediately feel the love of Christ that is shared between us. God, help us as a church to perpetually and always submit to your will for our lives. Not our will be done, but your will be done in our lives, Lord. Use this singing to unify us. Use these songs to just... Encourage us, Lord. Let us focus on you and not anything else going on in our life, Lord God, because you deserve every bit of our worship and praise. It's your name we pray. Amen. Church, let's stand and sing together. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of we watch and pray find in me thine all in all Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he watched it white as snow I find thy power and thine alone and change the leper spots and melt this heart of stone. Amen. Jesus paid it all.
Amen. Today, in light of the message we just heard, let's take a few minutes to read God's word together, and we are going to take some time to pray. Um, please read the words above me. Psalm 133. Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Church, as we have been challenged to fight for unity, we are going to take a few minutes of silent prayer. You can come down front and pray. You can turn around and kneel and take a humble posture before God. But ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you where you need to fight for unity with someone here at the church. Where do you have where you have unresolved conflict and need to reconcile. Maybe there's another area where you need to act and you have been refusing. So let's pray now for God to protect our unity. Let's pray for ourselves to be forgiving, loving, and peaceful people.
second let me read uh, uh, well actually before I read um, I want to mention thank you to all of you who helped with relief efforts from the hurricane we were able to uh, serve many many different counties uh, in Georgia um, and we also probably did um, anywhere in the range of 10 to fifteen thousand dollars worth of supplies uh, in relief so we're so thankful for that and uh, and we, we've heard just many testimonies from many different people who we supported. We also uh, were able to help out a family. You, you don't know them. If you want to ask questions of, of Troy and Emma, uh, through the forestry agency, they, uh, there's a man, uh, him and his wife lost their 
their entire home was just completely decimated. And all the while his house was sitting in ruin, he was off cutting trees while his house was completely collapsed. He was off serving his community. Um, and so, um, and so it's just, just incredible. So we were able to help provide some, some physical needs for them. Um, and so it's just awesome. Thank you for being a giving church. We appreciate all of you. And if you do uh, want to give more, you can. Uh, you can still give uh, online. You can designate that. You can give in one of the offering envelopes and designate that to relief if you need, if you want to, because we can still do more. Um, and if you see Brother Curtis, I don't see him in here right now. I think he might have stepped out. He took a team to Florida and also cleared roads, which is just incredibly generous uh, of him to do that work as well. So, um, So, he, yeah, he's, uh, uh, Mr. Gary said that uh, Curtis took down five loads of supplies plus generators and fuel and all of that stuff. So just incredibly generous. Just thank him, hug him, uh, and pray for him in those efforts. Um, let me, I'm going to close the service by just reading the passage from Colossians chapter 3. Um, just if you want to close your eyes, maybe this is the, the, um, the moment of just praying the scripture over ourselves. But let us hear it one more time from God's word. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Therefore... As God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a grievance against another. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. Above all, put on love, which which is the perfect bond of unity, and let the peace of Christ to which you were also called in one body rule your hearts and be thankful Let the word of Christ dwell richly among you in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is God's word to us today. Lord, bless the food today as we fellowship and gather together, Lord. Let us shake hands and love one another and hug one another and enjoy this body of believers that you've given us, Lord. Thank you for brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you for uh, not allowing us to dwell through this life alone. Lord, in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, we're also going to invite uh, Miss Barbara. Um, is Her husband is, is having a hard time with a, a surgery and all this stuff. If a few of you would like to come down and pray with her, I would love for us to pray with Miss Barbara. We had a, a request from one of our other church members for that. So y'all, the rest are dismissed, but if a few of y'all want to come and pray for Miss Barbara, let's do that now. It would be great. So.